Happy Palm Sunday. Get on your feet. It's a brand new song our team wrote for Holy Week for our community. Let's stand and sing together. Sun is risen, the night has ended. One final breath has set us free. No life is living, hopeless in me. Oh, death, oh, death, where is your sting? Hey, welcome to Crossroads Church, I'm Andy. Church people call this particular day Palm Sunday. It's the day that Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. It's also the first day of Holy Week. And without the events that happened during this week, about 2000 years ago, our faith would be completely irrelevant. But because of those events, we get to live in freedom. Now, let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you flew somewhere? And have you ever flown first class? Have you taken a train? Have you taken a road trip? When was the last time that you asked someone for a ride? When was the last time you rode the bus? And when you travel, do you like to travel like a king? I mean, first class, who doesn't love an upgrade? Now, Jesus, who was a king, rode coach. Could you imagine seeing the president hitchhiking? Jesus, who is more powerful and honorable than any president, didn't ride a giant, beautiful horse. He rode the one thing that was most like him, a humble, peaceful, suffering servant.
so you can lock in. Close your eyes so you can lock in and focus. This is the king who we just said, come like a flood, like a fire, because you have better for me. So I want to make a way for you. Listen to this description of who this king is. For he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And read it again. Talk about Jesus. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. And Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. And Jesus, this king invites you and me to come to him freely. That's the kind of king he is. That's the kind of king he is. I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else. 
fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one you for maybe the, I don't know, thousandth time for me, way more times, I come back to you and say, you're the king and I'm not, take your rightful place in my mind, my body, my soul, my heart, in my life. This week, reset me so I can clear the path for you to be who you are, fully king in me. I pray all this because of you, King Jesus. Amen.
so glad you showed up. So glad you're with us online. If you're in the room, why don't you turn to somebody and say, hey, glad to be here with you. our band and all of our sites for just really giving us some good, good, good stuff. And more of that to come. More and more of that today. Hey, whether you are a follower of Christ, a Christian, or whether you are newer to Crossroads and you're seeking to figure out if there's anything different from Judah, from, from uh, Buddha and Jesus, today is a significant day. Today is the beginning of Holy Week. Christians from all over the globe for thousands of years have made a big deal out of the time, what's known as Palm Sunday, all the way through Easter weekend. So this is the start of Palm Sunday weekend today. And I'm, 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 my goal today, my goal today, is to reframe maybe some ways that you see Jesus and to set you up to be able to have a week long filled with spiritually significant experiences. We booked a bunch of things for you in all of our sites and online. We didn't have to do these things. We all got more than enough to do as, a, as staff members and as volunteers, but we feel like there's something special to lean into these spiritual truths and the events of Jesus' life the last week of his life. So I'm hoping you're gonna take advantage of that. And so I'm gonna talk about Palm Sunday, what that means. You might've heard that. You might've heard a sermon on that. You might've heard something that was wrong. We'll find out. Maybe I'm wrong. You never know. But let's pray before we do anything else. God, I'm thankful for the ability to talk about something that has just gone on forever and ever and ever. Crazy. This week has happened for 2,000 plus years. And uh, we're just in this little corner of your kingdom called Crossroads, whatever city we're in. We're just this little corner of your kingdom and we stand in the midst of this this root structure and system that's been going out on all corners of the globe for so long and starts with you. So help me to understand and to communicate well who your son Jesus is, what happened on Palm Sunday and why that matters to us. And I pray these things according to the character and identity of Jesus. Amen. All right. So Holy Week starts with Jesus coming into Jerusalem and he knows when he comes into Jerusalem, it's the beginning of the end of his life. This is a major step of faith on his part. It's a major step of boldness. It's a major step of sacrifice on his part. He could have just kept the, the crowds coming and kept teaching and having everybody, in, everybody be in awe and, and do miracles and have people shocked by his miracles and had, had an amazing popularity contest. But he had a mission to do. And the, the stakes get higher when he comes into Jerusalem, which is the, the hotbed of Roman occupation for the Jews. Jew, Jerusalem is their holy city. It's their high holy city. And so Rome knew we've got to set up a beachhead here, have a strong presence here, because these people, we own them. These people do what we tell them to do. And so uh, Jesus, when he comes in, he realizes he's coming into a, into a tempest. Let's just read it. It comes from the book of Mark, chapter 11. It's actually, this story I'm going to give you today is in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's very, things, very few things in the Bible that are in all four of these things, these parallel accounts of Jesus' life. This is one of them. Let's read it, and we'll talk about it. Here it goes. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. Sometimes we, we think of things in the Bible as more spiritual than they actually are. Like, how does Jesus know that this donkey is there? Did he, have a, did he have a dream in the middle of the night? Like, thou shalt go with, getteth thy donkey. I mean, how does he know? How does he, how does he know this? You know how he likely knows it? He scattered out a day or so earlier and worked something out with the owner. 
That's how we knew. Let's keep going here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. So he sends his disciples in. They start getting this donkey and the, per, the owners go, oh, what, what are you doing? What are you, what, what's going on? They say, well, the Lord has need of it. Now, you could look at this as sort of voodoo powers. The Lord has need of it. And then the owner of the donkey goes, oh, okay, if the Lord wants it, he can have it. Like he loses his will and mind, like he's in the midst of the last of us or something like that with stuff coming out of his nose and out of his head. But that's probably not what it was. Again, Jesus maybe introduced himself to this guy earlier, and this guy had this interaction with Jesus. Maybe this guy came to see that Jesus wasn't just a teacher. He was actually Lord. And said, so, oh, oh, Jesus sent you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we worked something out. Go ahead, go ahead. Untie it and take it. And it goes on. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. There's a lot of things in this passage about who, who said you could take the colt? Colt is a donkey that's never been ridden. Who, 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 who said you could do that? Who said, they're making a big deal out of this because Jesus has set this up. And these people are not understanding except the owner of it is. So they bring this colt to Jesus. And they bring it to him. And this is how Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem. Jesus doesn't arrive in Jerusalem by accident. He comes here intentionally. This is the time of the high holy holiday of the Jews called Passover. He enters because this is a big thing for all Jews to be in the holy city of Jerusalem. And he knows this is go time. This is the final climax and culmination of his life. And the fact that he chooses to enter in riding a donkey says something. What does it say? There's three important props we're going to talk about today that are in this passage. Three important props. There is a, a donkey, there are cloaks, and there are palms. Donkey, cloaks, and palms. Three props that we're going to look at real quickly here today. Donkey. Let's talk about the donkey. Why a donkey? Why, why do the disciples come up Take this donkey and say, come along now, donkey. Why, why do they do that? I just can't get that out of my head from Shrek. It's like, <laughs> like three lines from Shrek I think of all the time. The other one is, uh, do you know the Muffin Man? The Muffin Man? The Muffin Man. Who lives on Drury Lane? Yes, it's an amazing, so it's an amazing movie. I need to watch it again. He chooses a donkey. Why is that? A few reasons. Let's take a look at Zechariah 9.9. This is a prophecy written about the coming Messiah, written hundreds of years early. When Jesus comes, hundreds of prophecies are fulfilled, which is why many, many Jews have come to see him as a Messiah. They're called completed Jews. They say, my faith is complete. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. Here's one of the prophecies about him, the book of Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Your king is coming, riding on a donkey. I believe that Jesus knows that this prophecy is there and he is intensely saying, I need to check the box and fulfill that prophecy. I think that's part of what he's doing. He knows these, some of these prophecies he can't possibly fulfill. Like one of the prophecies, they would gamble for his clothing. He couldn't fill that, fulfill that on their own, but that actually happened. There's a whole bunch of things he had zero control over. Jesus didn't have any control over being born of a virgin. Didn't have any control over so many things. But this is one that I think they said, the donkey thing. I need to do that and become a donkey. But there's more than just fulfillment of a prophecy that's happening here. There's also a message that's being sent. And why would this prophecy be way back when? Part of it is humility. We're going to see today. There's two things I really want you to get aside from these three, these three props. I want you to understand the idea of humility. How humble God is. How humble Jesus is. I want you to see it's part, of his, it's part of his DNA. And I want you also to feel a challenge, to feel a push, because he's powerful. 
When he chooses to come in on a donkey, it's a humble move. Because when he's coming into a city, if he's coming to conquer it as a conquering hero, he would be coming in on a horse. He chooses a donkey. Who is intimidated by a donkey? Nobody's intimidated by a donkey. And that's the exact point. He chooses a humble mode of operation to send a message to everybody that, hey, I know you want a conquering hero to come and take down Rome. I know you want me to use my my powers of persuasion with my tongue to rally up a crowd. I know you want me to use my power that you've seen me use in healing people and bringing people back from the dead, but I'm not going to do that for you. I'm not coming in as a conqueror. I'm coming in as a humble person who's riding a donkey. It's interesting that these people, it, lo- it looks like a beautiful scene. It looks like everybody's excited about it and everybody's fired up about it, but really, it's not that good of a scene. Let me read the last section here, verse 8 and following. And many spread their, their cloaks in the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who, were, who, were, who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom, our father David, Hosanna in the highest. It's, you got to look at stuff that is really odd. Like when Jesus is referred to, he's not referred to as Father David, except for here. He's referred to in the rest of the New Testament as Son of David. Whenever people, someone comes to get healed by him, they say, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, of your lineage, you're of the root. This was the prophecy. You are going to be of the... Uh, 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 the Christ child that's come from David's lineage. What do they mean when they say Father David? They're saying David was the greatest warrior king who killed more people than anybody ever has in Israel's history. He knows how to get people to go to war, bring the Davidic kingdom to reality, tap into your father, Father David. Get ready. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's get some blood. Come on. Let's have our way. Let's get done with these Romans right now. And Jesus says, no, I'll have none of it. I'll have none of your agenda. In fact, I'm not going to ride a horse like you're used to seeing a conquering hero coming on because that's what conquering heroes would do, coming on a horse. And I'm not even going to walk in front of my troops. I'm going to take a donkey because I'm going to tell you, and what he's saying is, I really don't have any time for your agenda for me. Your agenda for me and God's agenda for me don't match. It's the donkey. And then people are taking their cloaks and they're taking them off and they're, they're laying them down. And it's really a nice gesture because this is what they would often do with royalty is throw their clothes down, give them a soft cushion. If you're on your horse, you're walking, we're going to give you a little bit air mattress a little bit there to make it more comfortable for you. It's what you do with royalty. It's a, it's a sign of sacrifice. It's pretty good. But the question is this, Is this a sacrifice for the right reason? Are they sacrificing for the purpose of God or are they sacrificing for the purpose of themselves? We sometimes get those things mixed up. Let me tell you about me. I'm married. I'm married. And let me tell you something about my marriage. There's hard spots in my marriage. Always has been, always will be. It's really, I I'm, I'm, I'm love my wife, Lib. She just, she's an amazing wife. It's good. But you know, when you have two people who are together, two people have different perspectives, different agendas. It just just brings out difficult things. But here's the core. Here's the core uh, challenge with our marriage. It comes up again and again and again and again and again. You know what it is? Here it is. Lib doesn't do what I want her to do. I mean, I can't say it any more clearly than that. She doesn't do what I want her to do. And not only that, she doesn't stop doing what I want her to stop. I mean, that's basically, that's basically the problem with our marriage right there. That, that's basically it, right? And of course, she would say the same about me. See, when you're in a marriage, for those of us who are married, you know, there's, there's the agenda God has for marriage, and then there's the agenda you have for your marriage. And most of us are not even self-aware enough to even notice that really our agenda for the marriage is for the person to do for me what I want them to do for me. My agenda is for you to make me feel complete. My agenda is for you to make my life easier. My agenda is for you to make me feel emotionally satisfied. My agenda is for you to fulfill me sexually. My agenda for you is to fill in all the gaps in my life. My agenda is for you to make my life better. 
And that's not God's agenda for, for marriage. He's got a different agenda for marriage. This is not a marriage message. This is a, this is a Palm Sunday message, but I'll just say this one last time. If you want to build your marriage, the best thing I can offer you, we can offer you is couples camp. It's the last day to sign up is this weekend. Last, last day. I promise you, I promise you, there's nothing you're going to do for your marriage the next year. It's going to be better than couples camp. And if you go and you disagree, we will refund your money back. Promise that. And we're even letting you camp in your car this year. (laughs) We're even letting you camp in your minivan. Whatever you want. Fine. Great, great, great. What we learn is this applies to our own life with Jesus. That's really the heart of our problem with our union with God is God doesn't do for us what we want him to do. He doesn't give me what I want him to give me. He doesn't stop the people who are hurting me that I want him to stop. He doesn't bless me with the things I want to be blessed with. He doesn't put people down who I want to be put down. And see, it's really about us. And this is what's happening as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. It's about the people. It's about them. You're like, great, Jesus, you're here for me. You're here to make my life better. You're here to make all my political aspirations and all my difficulties just vanish because you, Jesus, are here for me. And Jesus isn't there for them. He's there for the purpose and agenda of God, which includes people But people aren't the starting point. Specifically, individuals and their needs aren't the starting point. It's honoring the voice and obedience to the call of God that he has on his life. And we make the same mistake that the people in those crowds did there. We we, we do some worship. We put some stuff down, make it good for for Jesus, take our cloak off. But we're doing these things to make him more comfortable so that we hope you'll do for me what I want you to do for me. And Jesus will have none of it. It's not what he's about. They take these palm branches. They start waving around these palm branches, right? Palm branches are a sign of of victory. You know, when Jesus is called father of David, they're saying, we want you to kill just like your father did, your great, 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 whatever grandfather. We want you to be like him. Conquer these people, kill them. Win. This is what the palm is. The palm was a a symbol of victory. A palm was placed around somebody's ears or around their neck whenever they won an Olympics uh, thing in ancient Greece or they won a gladiator match. A palm branch came to them. This was a big thing. In the Bible, we see the palm branch mentioned. Palm branch mentioned. In Leviticus 23, verse 40, it says this. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows in the rook, uh, on the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So there's a place for rejoicing with palms. A place for saying, man, great, winning is happening. It's great. But there's something else happening with these Jews who are worshiping, it seems to be worshiping Jesus. What they're worshiping is the dream that they have, the dream to kill the Romans. If you take a look at uh, an ancient monetary uh, coin for the Romans, Constantine. Constantine had a coin and had, had the, the palm around his head. And this palm around his head was a sign of victory. About 150 years before Jesus comes into Jerusalem, Greece and their king is crushing and hurting the Jews in a huge way. They take occupation of Jerusalem. They go into the temple. They take all the holy relics out of the temple. They melt them down. They do something for themselves. And they totally defile all of God's holy, sacred objects. And people were not happy. And one person, one person decided to do something about it. Judas Maccabeus. Not Judas related to Iscariot, a different one. And he rounded folks up and he was a catalytic spark plug. And he ended up throwing back and, and eliminating uh, the Greek, Greeks out of the temple and, and really gaining new ground. And because of that, because of that, What took place was they have a celebration for seven days. Still to this day, it's called Hanukkah. It's because of the Maccabean revolt. Because Judah and the Maccabeans, all of them came along and they put down the Romans. And what was their symbol? 
of the revolution, it was the palm branch. In fact, you could see 150 years earlier when Jesus was around, this was the monetary currency, is this coin that had a palm branch on it. See, they're waving a palm branch for Jesus saying, come on, do a Judas for us. Come on, Maccabean revolt. Come on, Jesus, come on, you can do it. It's, this is, okay, trigger warning. Are you ready? Trigger alert for everybody on the right and the left. Trigger alert, here we go. This is like rave, waving a red MAGA hat. That's what this is like. This is like waving a rainbow flag. That's what this is like. They're waving their flag saying, I want mine. I want you to give me mine. And Jesus, again, will have none of it. These people, we know that they're not into Jesus. I'll tell you why else. Not only do they call him father of David instead of son of David, not only that, but it's just a few days later where he's going to be on trial and Pilate is going to prop him up before a bunch of people and say, look, I'll give you back Jesus or I'll give you this murderer Barabbas. Who do you want? And the majority of the people, they shouted out, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. They realize this guy's weak. He gets captured. We don't have any part, part for him. Kill him. Kill him. The same people who are doing this. I wonder how many people proclaim to be followers of Christ and we wave our flag, whatever it is. We wave our cross. We wave our quilted Bible cover carrying case. <laughs> Do they even have those anymore? I don't know. We, we, we wave our Christian bumper stickers. We wave, uh, whatever, whatever. We, we, we just, it's like good luck charm declaring who we are, like, uh. But man, waving your flag versus laying down your life are two different things. Yeah. Waving your flag versus giving up your dream and your agenda for the dream of God is a different thing. Waving your flag for your life the way to happen that you want instead of your life to be under God's rule is an entirely different thing. And these people here, they don't want to be under God's rule. They want the blessings of God without the rule of God. And this is why for a whole week we get to wrestle with this. How much do you want God? What part of God do you want? Do you want his forgiveness? Do you want his instructions? What is it of God that you want? This is a God who is humble. This is a God who has power. This is a God who, who provides hope. And when we start crowding him and trying to bring our agenda, make him fill our agenda, God will leave our lives. I don't mean he'll abandon you and you go to hell. I just mean like you're not going to feel the presence of God. That's what Jesus does. Whenever someone has an agenda they put on Jesus, he starts, he just, he just removes himself. Let me give you an example. John chapter 6, verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him, by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So they're coming to other times, like, oh, we've got to take him by force, make him king. He goes, oh, no, no, I'm not having any of that. I'm, I'm withdrawing. I'm leaving. Whenever we want to co-opt Jesus for our agenda, you can expect Jesus to leave. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan for you. Doesn't mean, you, doesn't mean anything. It just means like you're not going to feel the presence of Jesus if you're trying to co-opt him for your agenda. And everybody does this. Everybody's got their proof Bible verse to prove that Jesus is, is, is on their side. The question is whether or not we're on the side of Jesus. Whether we're on his agenda, even if we don't know what his agenda is. He gives hope because his agenda has power. That's what's going to happen in, in Holy Week. He has hope and, and he's humble. He comes in on a donkey. He could have sucked in all the praise he wanted. He's, he's humble and he gives hope. This last week, weekend when we had John Burke, my friend, uh, talk about near-death experiences in heaven. Wasn't that just amazing? Wasn't it? I, I watched, I, I saw all those videos, you know, multiple times, cried every service, different things I saw in, in, in different videos I hadn't picked up before. John, by the way, is on my podcast, Aggressive Life. I've had him on three times. He's the most popular person I've ever had on because we all want to have our heart reoriented. He, 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 out, he blew past Matthew McConaughey's numbers on my podcast in like two weeks. Like Hollywood A-lister, whatever. How about a guy who could tell me about some hope? This guy's talk from last week, I want to show it to you again, I think beautifully shows the hope and the humility that Jesus offers. This guy had been stabbed multiple times and just before the last one went into his heart as a surgeon and as a psychiatrist, he met God. Here it is. When God shows up in your face, 
like a bomb blast. It really gets your attention. And I'm standing there in awe and time stopped. All I know is that God showed up as a light and the light was roiling with energy as you would expect if you were up close to say an, an atomic bomb. What was roiling even more was the love that came with it. It was, I'm sorry, I, I have a hard time talking about this. And in one single instant, all of his qualities were in my face. God's overarching quality is love. Everything is contained within that. His knowledge uh, came very suddenly as as an image of a library filling the universe. His power was undisputable. The joy is it will make you happy for a lifetime. I can't think about it without getting full of joy. His authority is so great that um, you would follow any instruction. Kindness, um, you probably know someone who's, someone who's kind. If you can imagine that kindness magnified a thousand times. Humor is, is something rather surprising. You don't expect God to show up ready to, to, to laugh his off. Purity, he is so pure. It puts your own condition in stark relief. You can see that you're not that and there's and there's humility if i had his qualities i would be so proud you know but he's not he is humble such humility is humble and he also has power which is why we have hope he comes in a donkey but he doesn't He's on a donkey forever. In the book of Revelation, the end of all things, a time that prophesies him coming again. Here's what it says in Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. At some point, Jesus will come in on a white horse and he will make war. At some point, he will come and he will bring justice. At some point, he will come and make everything physically right. But not this day. At some day, he is going to come and he is going to put pain where pain needs to go, but not on this day. At some point, he will make all things right. Everything will be in order. Everything will be the way God wants it, but not on day. Someday it's coming, but not on this day. And therefore, we wait in the tension. In the book of Revelation, another prophecy, chapter 7, verse 9, says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches, in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb eventually everything gets redeemed including the palm branch including perhaps people who are there that day and were about their agenda but they get switched to God's agenda and they start waving their palm branch with the one who's full of humility and hope and power who will one day, someday, come on a white horse, but not this day. Someday we'll see him in awesome physical power, but not this day. This day we see him in humility. This day we wrestle with our own frailties. We wrestle with our own faith and ask ourselves, what do I think of this man Jesus? Is could he be my answer? Could he be my life? Or other people who've given their lives to him for thousands of years, do they know something I don't know? I need that we need, we get for a whole week to go back down the teachings of the cross, the teachings of what communion is, the teaching of sacrifice, the teaching of God's love for us, the teaching of why he would do this for us. 
They didn't realize what he was doing was coming in. He was making room in the plan of God for them. Making room, and we'll talk about that on a Good Friday service and also on, on other things this week. He was, he was making room in God's heart, in God's kingdom for frail people like you and I who wave our MAGA hats and wave our rainbow flags. He was making room for us. And now this week, we have to figure out if we want to make room in our own schedules to zero into this king. Do I want to make room to do things and think things and pray things that I haven't for a long time or maybe never have? Do I want to make room and prioritize my spiritual growth and honoring and getting to know a little better the king that's changed world history? I hope you do. This is not the end of my talk today. This is the beginning of perhaps life-altering messages and information and transformation that we're hoping and praying and worked really, really hard to come your way this week. God, I'm asking as we come to worship you right now, as we worship you, this is the response of our hearts in all humility, God. We're, uh, we're, we're here, many of us, it's, it's uncomfortable to sing, but we're going to do it out of humility because we want a hope that lasts and transcends our petty preoccupations. You are good. We choose to make room for you today, Jesus.
This is my surrender. The question that we leave with today is, do you want to prepare for the King? Easter is not just another Hallmark holiday. It is a moment with beauty and redemption and meaning and new life that's available for you. Now, towards that end, we have an incredible week of physical and digital experiences designed to do just that and to immerse you in Holy Week. First thing, if you live near or around the Cincinnati area, we're offering a Thursday Last Supper experience and an immersive Good Friday service that you'll want to be in person for. Secondly, we have not forgotten about our Crossroads Anywhere family all over the globe. There's a Last Supper video on demand experience that you can check out as well as a live stream of our Good Friday service on Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And for this week only, we're actually going back to daily worship each morning on Facebook and other platforms. And last, but also maybe my personal favorite, we're gonna have an online night of healing on Tuesday evening that we'd love for you to join. You can find all the details and more at crossroads.net slash holyweek. And if you have questions, just click the little white bubble in the lower right-hand corner of our website. There are real people like friends of mine that would love to pray for you and answer your questions. Hey, thank you for joining us today and make sure to join us next week for an Easter experience you don't want to miss. Easter is a celebration of life conquering death. Because Jesus rose from the dead, you can be resurrected too.